So we'll have one, we'll have three states. And so we'll have one, two, and three. And then we'll let the probabilities to go from state one be one third. This one should look familiar to those who are in the course because this is the um, a one that's in the book. So one half here. So we're going to go from one to three is a probability of two thirds from three back to one, three fourths and two to three and three to two. So three to two is one fourth and from two to three is one half. OK, this. If we recall from last video or last class, I should say that this turns into a probability, um, a state, a probability transition matrix, um, the following. So let me go ahead and put from, and we're going to come from state one, state two, and state three, and we're going to go to state one, state two, state three. And those probabilities, we're getting them right off the right off the diagram. You go from so from one to one is zero, from one to two is one third, from one to three is two thirds, and we know this must add this row must add up to one because we're going to move, we're going to transition after every single step, right? Because this is discrete, every single step is going to transition to the next um, two. Uh, come back to one is one half, so very simple one half, zero, one half. <clears throat> and from three, it looks like uh, three quarters or three fourths of the probability goes back to one, and only one fourth up to two and zero. Okay, so this is our state uh, transition matrix that happens every single step. So the idea here is that if we want to know the long term average, so if we want to know the, the long term average time spent in each state. You know, for this discrete. time process, then it's a simple thing. Then we simply just um, then simply find those steady state probabilities. OK. Um, and how we do that is just that pi star. So we talked about this last class, pi star is equal to P. When this doesn't change anymore, um, then we're then pi star would give you pi star is equal to the steady state probabilities. Um, and these turn out to be uh, so pi star. If you go over to R and you do this like we showed you last time, you should get 0.39622. Six four uh, zero point two. I won't go so long on this one. Two two six four one five one. I guess I did. And then zero point three. So zero point three seven seven three five eight five. And if you don't remember how to do this, go back. Go back and look at the last video. Um, maybe, uh, you know what, we'll, and, and we'll do this at the end. So we will do this one when we go to R. Because we're going to go to R here in a, in a few. So I'll do this um, in addition to, to 
go back to the last video. So we we've, we've done this before, but we'll show we'll prove that that's that is what it what it is. Okay, so the idea here is that we're going to transition. So like I said earlier, uh, we want to show how to transition from this discrete time to a continuous time, and so um, let's just sort of describe what we're talking about. So so um, for a discrete time process, so for a discrete time process. Where the time in each state, where, just make sure that everyone is on the same sheet of music, where, sheet of music, where the time in each state is exactly one unit, one unit of time, whether that be a, let's see, I'll put it up here, well, we're going to have to come down and, and do it. So whether that be a, a second, a minute, an hour, a day, a week. I think our last uh, question was a week. We were doing sales of uh, aquariums and we were ordering things on a weekly basis. Um, and there was a demand of one per week, a week, a month, a year. Or so on and so forth. Could could be any of those one unit time steps. Could be two weeks, um, whatever it is. <clears throat> then our expected amount. Then our expected amount of time in each state. Each state. So in this case, for these three states, in each state, one, two, and three, would simply be that those uh, long-term, those uh, steady-state probabilities. So for state one, we would expect to be about 39.622, uh, so and so percent of the time. State two, we would expect to be 22.64. 0.64% of the time, and state three, uh, 37.74% of the time. And hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Um, when you, get so 39% of the time, we expect, you know, point, these probabilities sort of line up with the amount of time. And if it's just one in every single time that I transition to the next date, um, I'm moving from one state to the next, well then hopefully this, this makes a lot of sense. But what would happen if we did something a little different? So instead of letting those, um, every time I transition, uh, be one particular or one discrete time, let's let that in itself be random. Okay, so let's describe a process that's a little different now. So now we're transitioning to our, to our new idea. So I'm gonna draw a big giant line here. And so let's let, um, suppose we change the problem. Such that the amount of time in each state is no longer discrete, is no longer discrete time unit, one second, hour, uh, minute, or whatever. And now it's no longer a discrete time unit, but now it is a random variable itself. And let's let that random variable be distributed as an exponential distribution.
Okay, so for state one, let's just make up some numbers here. Um, again, I'm going to go along with what the book said, um, Mir Sharp's book. Uh, so for state one, let's let that be, um, let's define a, a random variable T1, and that's going to be the, the time in state one. Time spent. How about spent? The time spent in state one once it arrives in state one. And we're going to let that T1 variable be distributed as an exponential uh, one. And I'm going to put one over one for a second. And you'll see why I do that in the expected time that I'm that I am in T1, or I'm sorry, I'm in state one um, for an exponential distribution would be uh, one. So for state two, so you know, let's T2 be the, the time spent in state two, so everything there, and then we'll let T2 be an exponential one half. Oops. The expected time there would be two, whatever the time period is, whether it's a minute, second, whatever. It's just that it's twice as long as state one. And then T3, same idea. The time spent once it gets into state three is now an exponential one third, where the expected amount of time is three. So we would expect now three times. So when, once you get into state three, you would stay there on average three times as long as you would into state one. If you were sitting in state one or three halves as long as you would if you were uh, for state two. So we think state three is should be longer. So there's um, we could come up with a way to, to find that here. Let me. Um, let me at least put here what lambda is. And so what I'm trying to do is connect the dots here. So really, lambda 1 in this case would be uh, just simply just 1. Lambda 2 here would be uh, 1 half. You can get that right from, from here. And then lambda 3 here would be 1 third. All right, so the question here, the question um, is how does this continuous time idea, so how does this continuous, that's a U, one of those suckers is a U, continue, uh, I think we're good, continuous uh, time version, change our model. So, so we're, let, let's redraw. Let's redraw our um, state transition diagram because I think if we can redraw draw that, redraw state transition diagram, I think if we can understand sort of how it affects the state transition diagram, then I think it'll make sense. So remember, we had three states. So we're going to be at one. We're going to be state two. And we're going to be state three. So remember when we're in state three, we're going to be there three times as long as we would be in state one. So really the question is, well, what are these new numbers that go on here? So we're going to keep our probabilities. But we're going to add something, or I should say multiply. So we have different, Instead of calling it probability now, we're sort of thinking about it in terms of how, how, what, what is the rate at which we move from one to the next? So in this case, um, if I let this be one third and multiply by one over one, we get one third. If we 
come down here and have two thirds, right? That was our probability from moving from one to three. Um, if I expect it to be there for um, the, the same time as, as before, then I'm just going to multiply it by one over one. So we get um, the same thing that we did before, right? So I get, we're going to let this be one third and this one be two thirds. Now we're in a state where this one is there twice as long as state one. So let's think about that for a second. So this was one half from going from, from state two to state one. But how can I account for the fact that I'm going to be in this one twice as long as this one? Well, the one way of doing it is to multiply by one over one over two. So, so this becomes an, a rate now instead of a probability. Um, so we do the same thing with the two coming down. So the two to three, I believe, was one half as well. And I'm, I'm gonna again, I'm gonna multiply by one half because because I'm trying to account for the fact that, okay, so that we multiply this one by one, the, the one going from one to two by one, to account for the fact that he stays in uh, on average one time unit and now we're multiplying by one half to account for the fact that this one stays in for basically twice as long as the the per the um as being in state one so that's how we we sort of try to account for it so let me turn these into purple and we're gonna let those be one fourth and this one also be one fourth so that brings us to the for, to our last one so how am i going to account for the fact that um that I'm in this one three times as long. Um, I think we can sort of do the same idea. Um, so if I was here, so this one I believe was three fourths. So the probability of moving in from three to one is three fourths, but I'm gonna move at a different rate now. I'm gonna move only one third of the time because of the, the fact that it stays in this one three times as long as one and three halves yeah, three halves as long as state two. So this number would then be, let's see, one fourth. And then we do the same thing from going to three to two. It was um, one fourth of the time, but I'm going to multiply it by one third, and it leaves us with a one twelfth. So what we're trying to do is think of these as rates now. So the ones in purple, the numbers in purple are now sort of thinking about those as rates instead of probabilities. So how often do we move from three to one? Well, it has something to do with the amount of probability that we had to go in there, but it also has something to do with the expected time that, I, that I'm in state three. How often do I move from two to three? Well, again, it has to do with the probability and it has to do with the rate. So these things put together allows us to, to, to think of this thing instead of calling it, <clears throat> I'll leave it in purple, instead of calling this a, a um, oops, double clicked on it, instead of calling this a um, probability transition diagram or a state transition probability diagram, we're going to call this um, the rate diagram. So now this is called a rate diagram so the question is um because state three has a longer expected stay once it's in state three then the numbers flowing out of state three should be proportionally smaller than the ones leading out of state one. So let's look at that for a second. So the ones leading out of state one are the ones that are flowing to two and the ones that are flowing to three. So it's one third and two thirds. So state one has one third plus two thirds flowing out of it and so that's one so state 
three has, if you come to three, because he's he has a time that's three times as long, we would expect proportionally for, I, I would hope, hopefully it's one third, but let's see. So it's one twelfth. So I got one twelfth going to two. Plus how much is going to one is one fourth. So one fourth which is, uh, let's see, a fourth is three twelfths, so it's four twelfths, which is one third. Okay, so that makes sense. And then what do you think about state two? So think about that for a second. So the, the rate at which the, um, the states flow out of state two, hopefully is one half, but let's see, uh, one fourth, so it's one fourth plus one fourth, that's an easy one. Uh, two fourths or one half. Okay, so those make sense. So the rate diagram is doing um, hopefully what we think it should do. So given this state diagram, uh, uh, let's see. Before we move on, let's talk about what's actually happening here. What was um? Let me write it in red. Lambda one here was equal to one. Lambda two here was equal to um, one half, and lambda three here was equal to one third. And let's look and see what we're doing here when we're so we're taking the probabilities and we're multiplying it. So this really is one twelfth is really equal to um, let's see. Our, our probability times lambda three, and this one is our probability times, so which is one half times lambda two, because it's coming out of state of the state, and this one's coming out here, so that's why it's time multiplied by lambda three. So what we end up doing is we just take the probability in the, in that particular state and multiply it by its lambda. So I just wanted to point that out. We'll get to that again here in a few minutes, but um, just pointing out what, what's happening when, that you're multiplying the rates times the probability. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing that we want to do is um, define this new this term P sub I, and that's going to be the proportion proportion of time and state I. And it's equal to the probability that some particular, uh, at some particular time, we are in state I. So in other words, the proportion, so that's really what we're going for. This is the the, these P's are, are sort of synonymous to our um, steady state probabilities from before. So how can we figure those things out? Well, I claim that we can write some differential equations. So let me put up our little state probability diagram. And I claim that the, the how much, oops, not state I, but state one, how much state one is changing at any particular time is equal to the amount of flow out of state one, which would be, let's see, one third P one. Oh, it would be minus two because it's flowing out. So where am I getting that from? From this one here, it's flowing out of state one into state two. We're saying that's negative one third. And then I'm going to subtract the amount that's flowing out of state one and into state three. So that would be our two thirds. So two thirds P one. And then how much is flowing into state one is this one fourth. So on this leg right here, it's one fourth P three. So plus one fourth P three. And then how much is flowing in from two? One fourth. So plus one fourth P two. Okay. So that's a hopefully that's something that we can we can use here in a, in a few minutes. But let me let me just clean that up a little bit so we can write it sort of a linear algebra version. 
So negative 1 P1, because I just added those two pieces together, plus 1 fourth P2, plus 1 fourth P3. And that's going to be equal to P prime 1 with respect to time. And then P2 prime of T. Okay, so now I'll come back to, to state 2. And let's figure out the minus ones first. So we got a fourth going out here and a fourth going out to three. So minus, minus one fourth P two minus one fourth P two plus. So which ones are coming in? So one third P one. So one third P one plus. Uh, one fourth P three. So one, oh no, I'm sorry, one twelfth. One twelfth P three is, let's see, let's put it in a linear algebra. In other words, I want my P one first and then my P two, which is negative one half. I'll go ahead and change that to a negative or a minus. So minus one half P two and then plus one twelfth P three is equal to P two prime of T. And then our final one of these is P three prime. So P three prime of T is equal to negative one fourth. P3 minus 1 twelfth P3 plus 1 fourth P2 because that's coming in from 2, 1 fourth. And then what's coming in from 1 is 2 thirds. 2 thirds P1. So that would look like 2 thirds P1 plus 1 fourth P2 minus, let's see, minus one fourth minus one twelfth. So again, that's minus one third P3. And that's equal to P3 prime of T. Okay, let's turn this into a P1 prime, P2 prime. P3 prime. Let's turn this into a system of differential equations with our matrix notation. So negative one, one fourth, one fourth, a third, negative one half, and so forth. P1, P2, P3. Okay, so if this turned into a, um, a situation where we're balanced and we're in an equilibrium, equilibrium, so for an equilibrium, what does that mean? That means there's no change. And so P1 prime would be zero, P2 prime would be zero, P3 prime would be zero. So we'd be in a situation where we'd be looking for the null space of our matrix that we have right here. So I'd be looking for the null space of that matrix. <clears throat> and unless uh, the null space only contains one vector, which we know it would have to be the zero vector. So we're setting this equal to zero, zero, zero. So unless it only contained the zero vector, we know we're gonna have an infinite number of solutions. And so the last, the last thing that we have to do is because we're talking about proportion of time that you're in, 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 a, in one of these three particular states, and these are the only three states that you can be in, obviously the proportion of time has to add up to one. So our last equation, because we know we're going to have an infinite number of solutions, is that um, over every state i, that p sub i is equal to one. So if I sum up all, on, all, on all of my states, we're going to get that. So let's go ahead and put that into a matrix. So we're going to put everything into a matrix, including our last constraint there. And we'll see very quickly that we can come up with 
hopefully what the answer to this long term how often are you in state one versus state two versus state three negative one third oops i said i was going to put it in there but i didn't make my matrix big enough and i'm going to put one 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 and i'm solving this um, this was the null space when I had a zero vector, but now I added my extra constraint. So this is the matrix that I want the solution for. So we'll do this in, I think we're going to call this guy pi, capital pi again. We're going to call this my B vector. And then we know we got to do pi, transpose, pi. And we're going to learn that why we're doing this later on. <clears throat> um times or is equal to whatever this x is what we're solving for is equal to pi transpose and then my b vector and we're going to do this in um, r which is just be the solve command so solve pi um oops the transpose so i need the transpose of pi so in r you got to put this thing in a transpose of pi percent times percent pi comma so this is just the, this part right here and then we want to solve it and we're going to put this on our, on our other side so it's pi transpose um, b oh oops i gotta put my multiplication stuff in there so it's percent times percent b so this is what we're going to do in once we've set set up our matrix and have it all in there. Okay, so let's see what happens, and we'll come back and and validate this this thing here in a few minutes. So <clears throat> share our. Studio, and when we do that, we're just going to. Oh, we can do the first one that I said I was going to do once I shared our studio. So I'll do do the first one. So that was equal to P is equal to matrix um, zero one third two thirds and. So this is the first problem um, that we talked about in the discrete case that I said I was going to do when I, once I got the R. So one half zero, one half, force one fourth and zero. Number of rows equals three by row is equal to true. And then print P. And it looks like we got what we're looking for. Uh, let's see, three fourths. So I wanted a three fourths, one fourth. Uh, yeah, okay. So then we're going to transform this into M. Again, watch the last video. We're going to do that transpose P minus diagonal three. Print M. Uh, and we got what we're looking for there. And then this PI is equal to R bind um, M. And then I'm going to put one row of ones on there. That's our constraint. And then print PI. Right. And then B vector is going to be. Zero, 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 one. So this would be our same B matrix for both of these. Do that, and then we'll then we'll do solve. And so our solve is also going to look the same because I'm just doing the transpose PI, and then matrix multiplication times PI, and then transpose of PI. Matrix multiplication times B. 
and we get what we said we get. So if you go back and look at the, the video again, you'll see that it's simply just uh, the same thing I wrote in there, 0 0.3962, 2264, and 3773. And we're going to use those numbers here in a few minutes as well. Okay, so to solve this problem, this continuous case, um, so I'll put continuous, continuous case, uh, just continuous time Markov chain. We're going to set a different P. Our, our new P is going to be um, this. Let's see, it'll be, yeah, equals matrix C, um, let's see, negative one, one fourth, one fourth, and then one third, negative one half, and one twelfth. And two thirds, fourth, and negative one third. In row equals three, by row equals true, and then print. So just to make sure that it gives us the same thing that we thought we were going to get. Um, I'm comparing it to my to what I wrote in the one note and it does and so the next thing we want to do is find our pi that's just simply equal to r bind we don't need an m this time because i'm not uh, transposing it so and or subtracting the diagonal so we're not doing any of that business anymore we don't need to with the differential equation so all i'm doing is binding the um the one row so print print pi so this should be exactly what i have in my matrix over on uh, one note and it is true okay so everything was good and now i'm going to just solve so i'm going to come up here and i'm going to solve the exact same problem control c because we set everything up to be, have the same names i can simply come back here and solve and i see that the answer is 0 0.200 0 point so you can see that um, by changing this thing and not having all of them with equal amount of times, that now, because state three is in state three for three times as long as state one, you can see that it, it changed the, um, the proportion of time that we're in these different states. So this is an example of a continuous time uh, Markov chain. And we see sort of what happens here. So let's go back and summarize all of the stuff that, that we want to. Um, yeah, so a couple of, another way to check the same thing is to, so another check. So let's just check. So the, 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 our um, P vector was, if you go back to R, you'll see that it was 0 0.200. 0 0.288, uh, not 288, 228, 0 0.2, 28, I think there's a 5, 7 or something on there, 5, 7, and then 0 0.5714, 0 0.5714, and hopefully that makes sense that, you know, if you're in state 3 long enough, or longer than the other ones, then you would probably end up being in that one more, proportionally more than the other ones. Okay, so what's another way that we could have checked this? So I could have taken our our discrete proportions. So let's remember what those were. I think it was 0 0.3962 point, and this is star, this is our steady state probabilities in the discrete 2264 and 0.3774. So another way to do this problem, instead of the whole differential equations and whatnot, um, would have been to do a very simple thing and to say, all right, well, P1 is going to be equal to one time, because I'm only in state one for one time period times 0.3962 divided by one times 0.3962 
plus 2 times 0 0.2264 plus 3 times 0 0.3774. Right, so what I'm doing now is I'm normalizing this thing. This bottom down here is equal to 1.9812. I'm going to use that here in a second because I'm going to have the same denominator for all of these. And so this one's about 0 0.2. 0.199999, so uh, that's P1, so P2 would have been, so I'm taking the second one now, um, so I'd be in there twice as long as the first one, times 0.2264, and we divide by 1.9812, and you get approximately 0 0.28, uh, 0 0.22, 0 0.2285. So I'll leave this, you can get your calculators out and check me on that, which is what we'd expect. And then the last one is three times 0.3774 divided by 1.9812. Again, normalizing this thing, we get approximately 0.571 and which is what we'd expect. Okay, so the, the idea here is that um, you can do this with the differential equations using the rates and whatnot, or you could do, use, um, you know, you, you, you could have done this the, the normalizing way. Um, this won't answer every question that you'll be faced with, so that's why we had to, uh, this just answers this particular one, but um, at least you can check and make sure that it makes sense for, for both of those two. Okay, the last thing I want to do is is, is kind of what I was talking about a few seconds ago, but I'm gonna, I think I'll do it a little bit a little bit better, a little bit more um, direct, if you will. So if this were state one, state two, and state three, and we said that state one had an exponential lambda one, and we said that state two had an exponential lambda two. And that state three had an exponential. Now, notice that I'm not putting numbers in here now. Lambda three. And then we had the same probabilities that we had with the, uh, the state transition diagram. So I'm going to come back here. And I just want you to note what we're doing here. So this was three-fourths before. And this one was two-thirds. And this one was one third. And this one was one half. And then one half coming out of that. And then three was another fourth coming up. Okay. So for state one, all we did to get those rates was we multiplied by lambda one. And I multiplied this one. I'm sorry, the ones that were coming out of state one. I was multiplying by state one. So go back and look above, and you'll see one third, and one third times one, and two thirds times one. And then what you do for um, for state two is you multiply it by whatever your lambda two is, and whatever the ones that are coming out of state two, you multiply those by lambda two to get those rates. And then for state three, you do the same thing. You multiply with the probability times your lambda. So we could have changed the lambda to whatever we wanted it to be, and this would have been the general process. So, so don't think just because we solved that one problem earlier that that's the only problem that we solved. Um, really, we solved any. So, so if you're going to turn a probability a transition diagram into a rate diagram, then you just simply use that exp whatever the lambda is in, in your exp exponential distribution, you multiply by the probability. The problems that we dealt with in this course, so the problems that we that we'll deal with in this course are problems that we will deal with in this course will look like this one. Like this or um, what's called um, birth, okay, so let me just, this course, 
using here I'll, I'll, using continuous time mark all chains that's CTMC you might see C CTMC sometimes will either look like this problem something like this problem or uh, be what's called a birth death and we'll talk about birth death in the next birth death process will be this the topic of our next video all right so i got have fun